This is a sermon for Sunday, August 30th, 2020. And the text is Exodus 3, verses 1 to 15. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be delightful in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. The familiar, powerful story is full of vivid images. If you're old enough, the images are from Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. But I hope you've also seen, perhaps with your children and grandchildren, the Princes of Egypt, which manages to evoke the majestic mystery of this passage. Sunday school coloring sheets aside, I wonder how this story of Moses recalls our own encounters with the divine. And I wonder how this story of God resonates with our own understanding of the Holy One we worship. I wonder how it calls to us now. Let's just dwell in this story for a few minutes. We skipped a whole lot of things between last week's reading when baby Moses was rescued by five courageous women. Moses grew up as a Hebrew in Pharaoh's Egyptian court neither fish nor fowl, and had to flee for his life when his anger, in anger, he murdered an Egyptian foreman who was beating a Hebrew slave. He married a Midianite woman from a desert tribe that teases him about his Egyptian accent. Basically, Moses doesn't fit in anywhere, and he ends up tending the sheep of his father-in-law. And now this passage begins by saying, he led his flock beyond the wilderness. After months of COVID, when I've been saying we are in the wilderness, this feels about right for the church right now. We're a bit beyond the wilderness. And maybe it is full of hope to say beyond the wilderness is a time that is ripe for encountering God. This story wouldn't even have happened if Moses hadn't turned aside when he saw the burning bush. It's an important observation about the spiritual life, this paying attention, being awake. I wonder if other days he walked by the burning bush too busy to notice or to be curious. My experience is that encounters with God do await us when, in the midst of ordinary life and everyday tasks, we take time and space and attention to turn aside. I pray that the weird pace under COVID-19 restrictions have afforded you the space to turn aside. The bush is burning, but not consumed. There's a fiery holy, this holiness here in this inextinguishable flame. Fire that is both dangerous and alluring. We're all too aware of that danger right now in wildfire season in the Kootenays. Fire in different circumstances can either be frightening or comforting. Untamed, yet sometimes heartening, a powerful image of God. And when God sees that Moses has turned aside, God calls him by name, Moses. And Moses, fully attentive, gives the appropriate response. Here I am. There's a readiness to listen. Take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. I confess that my theology is that all ground is holy. All ground is a thin place where God's realm intersects with the human world. To turn aside, to open, to acknowledge this holiness, to be silently attentive to God's presence can happen anywhere, not just in our church buildings, even on Zoom worship in our own kitchen, certainly in our own gardens and in the woods, in the presence of our loved ones, whether we're searching for God's voice or taken by surprise. Take off your shoes. In our time, we are called back to a deep reverence for all earth, all soil, all bushes. As the eco-theologian Sally McFaig says, we need to claim reverence for the earth the earth as a metaphor for God's body. Take off your shoes, you are standing on holy ground.
Anthropologists note that many cultures take off their shoes not only when entering a worship space, but upon entering a home. So some commentators wonder if this command to Moses, this stranger in a foreign land, was a way for God to say to Moses, you're home. Home in the recognition of God's presence here. Home in this holy mountain. When I was in India this past January, I loved seeing the huge array of flip-flops and sandals outside the door as we entered worship space. We all went barefoot into the sanctuary. I did discover that when it's 35 degrees and I'm in bishop's robes for half-hour sermons and even longer translations, having bare feet on tile floors is very effective for keeping cool. But aside from that unexpected bonus, I love the action of removing our shoes. It was spiritually grounding. It brought a physical awareness of being in God's presence together. As we listen with Moses, what do we find out about this God, the God of our ancestors? This God who calls Moses and still calls us today. God says, I have observed the suffering of my people. I have heard their groaning, and I am going to deliver them from their oppression. And I am sending you. Then and now, God sees and hears suffering and longs to liberate people from oppression and sends us. Typical of all call stories, Moses has objections, more than one. I'm not qualified. I don't have that skill set. I can't speak. Finally, Moses will even plead, send someone else. Note that God does not argue with all of these objections. God doesn't say, oh yes, of course you're qualified. You speak Egyptian and you speak Hebrew. You know both cultures. You have the passion for justice. Instead, God ignores all of the arguments. None of that matters. And instead, God says, I will be with you. Moses still wants reassurance. He still wants more control over the situation. What is your name? Moses asks. And the famous non-answer that God gives Moses still entices and fascinates me today. Not really a name. God says, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. The letters in Hebrew, Eya, Asha. The name so holy, Jewish people do not pronounce it in prayer or worship. God's name is built on the verb to be. I love the mystery of this, a verb, active. God refuses to be pinned down or controlled or defined by us. Over the next few weeks, as we progress in the Exodus story, the character and the name of God will further unfold. Not only a God who hears the cries of oppression, but a God of steadfast love, mercy, and forgiveness, who rescues and accompanies through the wilderness, who says afterwards, I brought them out that I might dwell with them. A God who longs for indwelling relationship. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Steadfast love, yes, but this is not a cozy, familiar God, not mushy, sentimental love, but fierce love that demands our whole being. The insight of C.S. Lewis in the Narnia series is Aslan is not a tame lion. We cannot domesticate God. We can only take off our shoes in reverence and say, here I am. We are called into encounter with this mystery. And encounter with this holiness will always call us into discipleship. To participate in God's deliverance from oppression, our own and that of others. The response to God's call is always for the good of the community. Where do we need liberation? We need liberation from greed and consumerism that enslave us and the earth. 
from racism that dehumanizes all of us and causes huge suffering to many. From rampant individualism that blames the victim rather than the system and thus fails to find communal solutions. The opioid crisis is one example of this. Our, our discarding of those who are mentally ill is another. The oppression of gross financial and social inequities in our society, in the world. We need liberation from that. We need liberation from our failure to welcome refugees in wealthy countries. We need liberation from unfair labor practices that have kept people working part-time with no benefits, so people working in care homes have to move between two jobs. All the cracks in the system that had become even more apparent during COVID-19. All the many shapes that Pharaoh takes. All the places where God says, I have observed the suffering of my people. I have heard their groaning and I am going to deliver them. And I am sending you. God is still working for liberation. God is still calling us to participate in this liberation for ourselves and the whole earth. We are called to cooperate and give leadership in this holy freedom from all pharaohs. COVID restrictions give you more time to write handwritten letters to political leaders, to remind them and urge them to keep the priorities of care for the earth and care for the poor and the marginalized. With that all the urgent anxiety about restarting the economy, now is the time for us to keep in front of our leaders God's priorities for justice and fairness and the earth. And as you start to say, I don't have enough experience to do that, God will say, that doesn't matter, I am with you. And as you figure out the specifics of how you respond to this discipleship, God's promise remains, I will be with you. Thanks be to God.